I used to go and do that like Saturdays and Wednesdays and I hated it so much. I never wanted to pay for someone to wear my clothes. You can figure out a way to fix it. They're gonna stay around. Yeah. People will stay around. I want that essence of represent where people can walk in, they can smell it, they can feel it, yeah. they know it's us. Can you tell me how much the brand is worth today? This year we'll do. George Heaton. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. First of all, I have so many people who have been asking me about the trousers which I wear on a regular basis, I the twenty four seven cargo <laughs> pants. They're sick, sick products. Yeah. I have to say, I, I don't know, man. I've seen like they blew up, mm. and then you started wearing them, and now everyone's like, "Oh, Mike Dustin wears them pants." Did they actually say that? <laughs> yeah, we get it a lot. Every vlog you post, you wear them a lot. You train in them and stuff, yeah, don't yeah. you? So everyone's always commenting on them. Yeah, which is great. How long you've been doing represent for now? Like eleven years in the game, doing yeah, this? nearly twelve years. Fuck. But you feel like recently, past few years, it's popped off. Yeah, the brand really blew up 2019. Mm. It was very steady before then, very slow. Just a group of friends, like, having fun with it. And then kind of the year before COVID happened, we really got stuck into it. Like, a lot of shit happened in the business. A lot of people left, changed a lot, and grew up really matured. Me and my brother matured a lot in that year mm. and just put our foot on the gas more. So was it originally it started with just you, you and your bro? Yeah. I was in college. The last college project was to design something that would sell. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to do something that wasn't in the family business because my dad sold cars, my granddad sold cars. Like they were in, like, I guess they were, they were working on motors all the time. Mm -hmm. And I used to go and do that like Saturdays and Wednesdays and I hated it so much and I didn't want to do it. Um, but I had to prove to my dad that like I could go and do something ma like myself. Mm. Me and Mike grew up drawing, sketching, painting, like creative people. So then when we had the clean buses and cars, it was like the opposite of what I wanted to do. So I think that kind of just pushed us into like, I have to prove a point here and I have to go and do this on my own. Yeah. Mm. And what would you say is the, the difference between like you and your brother in terms of your roles? Because I've been watching... Um, the stuff on YouTube, which yeah. you've been doing, which is really cool. Thanks. But you're, you're definitely more involved with that compared to your brother. Yeah. I guess like after quite a few years, we kind of separated out into what we're best at. Mm -hmm. um, just naturally. Like I never said to Mike, you need to do this. I need to do this. Or he never came to me and said, I want to do this, whatever. Like he's naturally grown into like an artist where he can sit in a room, no distractions, and he can draw something for 12 hours straight not even look at his phone, not eat, um, not speak to anyone. And he's got that skill that I don't have. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, I, like we both came from the same thing. Whereas I'm like, I need to go, I need to do things. I'm very like creative in the terms of, I can think of stuff, I can conceptualize, but he can make it happen. Yeah. So when we come together to do that, that's what works in the business. It was rare that to have that amount of focus for such a long period of time like that's one thing i suck at like my attention yeah. span now is terrible gone yeah <laughs> and i think that's largely down to social media because yeah, i'm like is. bouncing between apps like i go on there to do something and then i get distracted for 20 minutes put my phone away and then realize i didn't even do the thing which i was supposed to do yeah yeah i think that whole like instant gratification thing of life now is just like dude you can order your food and have it in five minutes you can do this you can do that everything's a click of a button Mm. Um, so to find people that don't need that is insane. You got to keep them, and Mike is that. Yeah, and I'm not. Yeah. Damn. What? Is, so you spent? Um, you grew up in Bolton, mm -hmm. but you're based in Manchester. No, I'm actually I live in Bolton. Okay. So a little town called Rivington, Horwich, like nice hill, lovely little area just on the outside of Bolton, um, and. Mum and dad lived there. I lived there with my mum and dad till I was like 26, 27, mm -hmm. just grinding it out, used their garden shed, and then eventually rented a little property down the road. And obviously as the business has grown, I wanted to be there. Like I watched my dad, I know I keep referring to my dad, but I watched my dad drive an hour to work every morning, an hour home, and like I didn't want to do that. So it was like, I need to be with my business. Like if I'm going to focus on this for, the, for my career, mm -hmm. I want to be there. So rented a little unit there, built the business from there, bought a house there. Everyone who started off with the business is from there and it has like a great rail network into Manchester. So we bring a lot of people in from there every morning. So it's a good place to be. I guess as well, 
you're not going to be bombarded with distractions in Bolton. There is zero distractions, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and the weather is not the best either. No. Yeah, that's why it's been full focus. It's been 12 hours a day every day for the past mm -hmm. eight years or so. And that's like, I can see that just from watching you on social media, like you're not like wasting your time on anything else. You, your focus and attention is nowhere else. It's literally on represent yeah. all day, every day. But that's my mission. Like I'm fully into that. Like there's nothing, mm -hmm. I don't know anything else. And like we were talking about earlier, I, I haven't experienced like the best life that I could have mm -hmm. because I've been so focused on it. So maybe there's going to be a point soon now I'm getting a bit older where I can lay the focus off a little bit, but I love it, so I'm, I can't complain. So if, if you were to step away from the day-to-day -day activities that you're doing at the moment, would that have much of an impact on the way things are going and the trajectory the company's on? No, if you'd have asked me a year ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I've, like, this year I hired a CEO, I've hired a full C-suite team, I've got, like, directors and managers that handle teams, so I can be out here, like, I can go wherever I want and do whatever I want. But I like being in the thick of it. I like yeah. I like being the fit model. I like designing all the clothes. I like making sure every detail matters. So yeah, because you even see when you're doing the campaigns, like you're there, like you're yeah, styling, you're and styling. Fit. <laughs> like I, I was thinking about this because I, I don't do that with my stuff. I have um, my guy who's like the marketing director. Yeah, I kind of leave that to him. But then I think, man, maybe I should be getting a little bit more involved. Yeah, I guess it depends what what your focus is in the business, what you enjoy doing. Like I enjoy doing campaigns. Yeah. I enjoy the the final image. I enjoy putting that thing on Instagram and getting the good feedback from it. Mm -hmm. And I've done things in the past where I've given it to an agency to do. And straight away, the customer knows, like, these guys haven't styled this. Yeah. This isn't worn the way they would wear it. This isn't tucked this way. Like, there's creases in the clothes. I like, make sure there's none, none of that. Like, that doesn't happen with us. Anything, I feel like anything that's not in-house is not done to the very no. best. It never is, but Standard. have you got to give it 100% all the time? I don't know. Yeah. Can you tell me how much the brand is worth today? <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess you... I've never released the numbers just because I've let always let the product talk. Mm -hmm. um, this year we have to release our numbers. So that'll go live in in June. Will this podcast be out before then or not? It'll be out this weekend. Just, just tell us now. It's, like, it's no problem. Just tell us now. <laughs> right, as long as you don't put it on the YouTubers, represent makes this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, this year we'll do around £80 million. Pounds, Jeez. Which, yeah, three, <laughs> three or four years ago we were at £8 million, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's grown phenomenally over the last few years. Do you know what's... I found this quite interesting. You've done this without getting influencers on board to push it, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Now, we, we started using a few now, but it's mainly just for 247. Mm -hmm. um, I always just wanted to grow the brand organically and I didn't like the way especially fast fashion brands would utilize influencers it was very forced right mm. you know when someone's posting something and they've got it for free or they're getting paid for it mm -hmm. I never wanted that I never wanted to pay for someone to wear my clothes like if I'm going to send someone the clothes for free then if they love it they're going to wear it mm. and I'd just let, let it happen like that I think it's the, it's, it's the quality of the products which has done the talking yeah. And the word of the mouth. I think that's massively underrated. It is, but that takes so long. Like you don't realize like that snowball effect isn't overnight. It isn't two years. It isn't four years. It's it's like, like, like yeah, we've been doing this 11, 12 years now. Mm -hmm. Like we've not grown straight away. We didn't blow up. Like a lot of brands come into the scene, blow up. Like I used to get so angry because I'd see brands come over and one guy would make a t-shirt and it'd just e explode. And I'd be sat there like five years in, like, why is this not happening to us? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's taken a long time. Were you originally getting everything manufactured in Britain? Yeah, used to make everything in Birmingham and London. Because mm. um, you said you wanted to have that British feel to it. Yeah, I wanted everything to be British made. I wanted to be like the next Burberry. I wanted to be very British, iconically British. Mm. Um, and we did that for as long as we could until it was at the point where we didn't have enough margin to wholesale, so we couldn't go out to stores. And the quality actually wasn't as good as what we thought it was because Britain's very far behind in clothing manufacturing. Mm. Like, it's old school. They've got... The factories aren't big enough. The factories aren't capable of using, like, 3D technology or better machinery because they can't afford it. So it got to a point where it was like, we now actually have to leave Britain for manufacturing if we want to grow. Yeah, I saw that, <laughs> that clip where you were talking about the built-to-last jacket. 
yeah, which you got made, one. <laughs> and it literally didn't last very long at all. No, I didn't. I think it was like two wires. <laughs> and you had to basically refund everyone. <laughs> Refunded everyone, yeah. That was the first outerwear piece we made. And like my dad actually lent me some money for that because I didn't have enough money to do it. Mm-hmm. And I paid him back the night after the launch because it made the money back. And then all the refunds started coming in. And I was fucked. What did you do? Just... Would you, like, like at that point in time when you have to give all these people their money back yeah it was hard it was like a hard few months when people were realizing after the wear wore it a few times and then they you could get the emails coming in and then they talked to their friends that they'd done it and it just look it was only 300 jackets mm. so it's not a lot in the scale, grand scale of things now but back then it was like a catastrophe yeah and you think like you've almost fucked it with those people because they're probably never going to buy yeah. you yeah or so you think but Look, if you can communicate to them what's happened and then mm-hmm. like you can figure out a way to fix it, they're gonna stay around. Yeah. People will stay around. You do so now is the majority of what you produce made in Portugal? Yeah, Portugal and Italy. Why? Because um, I'm I'm cur- I have my own clothing brand and I'm so fascinated by I get so many people telling me, oh, like, oh get it made here, get it made there, blah 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 blah. But I don't know the ins and outs of actually like I don't have the time to be honest to go yeah, to the factories to check everything out because yeah. I imagine that's what you do when yeah, you're doing but, these trips you go to the factories you like you feel the product you speak to the yeah. people who are running the factory so you know like who's legit right. and who's not and we've just been around the world and figured out what the best place is to make the best things like Portugal is really renowned for its jersey production everyone makes their jersey there Givenchy Heider Aikerman Louis Vuitton Chanel like by jersey you mean t-shirt t-shirt hoodie sweat yeah okay anything that's like uh knitted cottons Mm -hmm. so go there that's that's the hub there's a city which is called porto which is like the hub for that stuff Mm. um and look it's a two-hour flight from us we go like the girls in the production team or the girls in product or myself or mike or whoever it is we go over over there every week or two checking things up it's like it's like it's so close to home that they don't need to get on a however many hour flight to China and speak to these suppliers yeah. that can't I mean, speak your language. That's I get my stuff made. And it's just headache. Like if, yeah, it's but, the, the, the round of the samplings mm-hmm. because I have a team in the UK as well. So if I want to see something, it goes, China, like, they UK. communicate to China. Yeah. China sends it to the UK. Then they kind of do the first approval, send it to me. It's a long and then process. if I don't like it, yeah. then they have to do it all over again. So when I've like if I've had shirts done or like the shorts initially when I was getting the right design, yeah, it was so frustrating and like demoralizing because you're like you ready to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I want to, especially when you've designed it and you say you literally say to them just make this. They can't do it. No. Yeah, it's frustrating, but you can find the right factories all over the world. Like some in China, some have some of the best factories. Mm. Like I'm not saying that Portugal is the be all and end all. Like we still make some some things in China, we make some things all over the world, just because there is better resources in different areas. Mm-hmm. Definitely. If you, when you're re- releasing a new product, how many rounds of sampling do you have to go through? Ooh, depends on the product. Mm. Like we're about to un- like launch a very plain collection called the Initial. That's been through nine months of me wear testing stuff mm-hmm. and fitting things and changing millimeters here and there. But I found that. Like right, like like you just said, you want things out now. You want to get it in, like one little change, get it done. You 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 raring to go with it, right? Mm. But no one else sees that. No. So the, the customer doesn't even know that product's coming yet. So you don't need to get so like annoyed about the how long the process is. As long as you're getting it right, and you have a backup of more product to come after that or before that, then it should flow well. Mm-hmm. How do you anticipate? how many units to get because i've seen before like when you've done these new releases yeah they sell out like a sell out in minutes and then there's not really much you can do you just have to wait another couple of yeah. months until you get more stock but that's a game as well mm. there's different look we have a full merchandising team where they're constantly just looking at the numbers what's done well what's going to do well what's coming into trend what's not what's george posted that has got a lot of comments on it, what's not worked on the comments. Like there's there's a method behind all of it. Like there's a science behind everything we do. But sometimes we like just ordering five hundred or a thousand or something and letting it sell out. Because yeah. it creates more demand, right? Mm. And demand then makes that consumer want to come back. 
Yeah. Because they can't get it. So you get in a lot of stuff made in Portugal, other places. You have the warehouse where you store everything in the UK. So we've got... Because I was curious to know how Brexit affected things. Um, we actually moved to uh, a warehouse in Belgium when Brexit happened. Mm. So we have all of our EU orders and US orders go out from Belgium. All of the UK orders come out from the UK. Okay. Yeah. So we have two distribution points, yeah. both third party. They're not owned by me. Mm-hmm. Um, they're called Blackman. They do like Gymshark, Lululemon, big, mm-hmm. big unit. So we can grow like that again when we, when we really started growing was then because we could just put as much stock as we wanted in. We weren't constrained by our little warehouse. Yeah. Did you do that straight away or did it take some time? No, we, we, we did our own stock until 2018. Moved to a local one where we outgrew it in a year. Then we moved to these guys called Blackman. Mm. And then hopefully end of this year we'll open US, maybe Australia, and even something over here. Yeah. You, I think you mentioned that you the US is a tough cookie to crack. It is. Why? I've been trying to crack it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that um, is? Because like... They, they shop different, even though they're English speaking and they're, they're like, and I know it sounds stupid, they look like us, they, they talk like us. Mm. They, they don't shop the same. They're not like, we're very localized to how we want things to be. They're a different way. Like, you're a British brand, there's a British brand or an American brand, and you're an American, you're probably going to buy the American brand. Mm-hmm. Um, just like if you're a British guy and there's a British brand or an American brand, you're going to buy the British brand. So you've always got, you're always the underdog against the Americans. Um, and the, just logistically, it's a lot harder. Mm. Is there any British brands doing well in the US? Um, I guess all the top luxury brands will, the Burberry's. Mm. Um, but I know All Saints did really well a long time ago, but they did a store strategy where they opened like 200 doors in the US. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. At this very moment, for us, it's hard to find a blueprint, but we are growing there consistently mm-hmm. over the past two years. So it's working. What we're doing is we're doing a lot of like pop-ups, activations, and just being there more, being involved with things. Like we went to Coachella the other a couple of weeks ago. You see people in the brand, you're meeting customers, you then get an opportunity to do a pop-up or go on this YouTube or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It all works, right? You, you say you're getting recognized more and more now as yeah. being one of like the the owners. Yeah, it's cool. Like as soon as we got out of the car here, like one guy stopped and was like, "Oh, can I get a picture?" Mm-hmm. It's good. I mean. In England, yeah, it's wild. Yeah. But in especially in Manchester. Like you can't walk around in Manchester without seeing owners club everywhere. Which is though. amazing to see. Um, but I'd love that to happen globally. Yeah. What's your approach to actually getting your items in store? So I imagine there's a lot of people who are watching this podcast and they either have their own brand or like they're thinking yeah. about starting a brand. How and even myself, like I'm curious to know what are the steps you go for through. a wholesale strategy. Yeah. Like how, how do you decide, right, okay, I want to sell them in these particular mm-hmm. stores. I think firstly, you got to prove your concept. You got to have an online store. You got to be doing the numbers. Mm. Then you've got to really look at your margins and make sure you've got enough room to be able to sell to them stores. Cause if you've not, and you're then paying for your shipping, you're getting it into the stores that are giving you backlash on broken product or whatever, you're losing money all the time. Mm-hmm. So get your margins right approach the stores when you're doing enough already. Like if you've not got a name behind you and you've not done something in the past, why would that buyer want to put? It's like gambling, right? Yeah. Why would that buyer want to buy your brand if there's no proven track record? And what you see happens is for many years we were like, oh, I want to really want to be in Selfridges. When is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? And then it happens. But then if you don't sell well, they'll, they'll, you'll be out in two seasons. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to re-engage that relationship. But the good thing is at the moment is because the brand is selling so well that it's going into stores, it's selling out in the stores, the buyers are ringing up a week later like, can't believe this, need to buy double, double down, double down. And it gets to a point where like you can then over distribute and it's in too many doors. So it's like finding the right balance of making sure them stores are selling through your product and they're not going in sale so it's not diminishing the brand name mm-hmm. and like it looking good in the stores is another thing. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it's just playing the long game with it. Have you ever thought about doing your own stores, like yeah. permanent stores? We're looking for London at the moment. We've been looking for about a year, trying to get the right space. Um, I think we've found one. So that 
probably would open this year if it if it goes to plan. Mm. I want to do London. I want to do Los Angeles. I think Gymshark have just done one, haven't they? Yeah, they've just done a massive Regent Street store. Yeah. Crazy place. Um, yeah, London, Los Angeles. We have like a built-in store in Selfridges in Manchester, mm-hmm. which is staffed by us and stuff, which is cool. Um, but I want that like essence of represent where people can walk in, they can smell it, they can feel it, yeah. they know it's us. Um, but have the fragrances in the exa- exactly, the yeah, the- just all the little accessories that you can't sell online. Mm. Um, but like at the moment, because the brand is growing so so much, like we've not got focus on it. Mm-hmm. Like if we had time to focus on it, we would definitely roll out a store strategy quick. How do you keep up with the growth? You just hire more people. Yeah, I'm I'm actually really bad at hiring. <laughs> I'm not the best. Like I always wanted people to be a certain way, do this a certain way, have this and whatever. But since I hired, I hired a CEO. He's probably been in the business nearly twelve months now. Yeah, um, well, that was that. That's been a game changer. That's the game changer for me. Yeah. yeah that's been insane like for so many years i didn't want to do it because i didn't want to let go Mm. and i didn't want to have to not be told what to do by someone but someone else make decisions as well as me and the hard part was is like i was never good with geography languages uh hiring like building out teams teaching people like i'm not good at that i'm i'm a guy that can draw clothes see the future of how i want things to fit take good photos, post on Instagram. Like that's really all I do. Mm -hmm. And although it looks like I do a million things on social media, like there is teams behind all of it that like I need to give credit to. Like I've got product teams, got PR teams, got content teams, got production teams, got merchandising teams, got marketing teams. Like there's so much more behind the brand than what you actually see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So who hires? Uh, (laughs) Do you hire someone to just... Yeah, the hiring. Yeah. yeah, CEO, HR, and then obviously I have managers of all. Each team has a manager, so mm-hmm. it's like chief product officer, chief marketing officer, all that stuff that didn't really make sense to me until these guys came on board and told me what to do. Because I never learned from anyone. Yeah. I never had a mentor. Like, this is the fashion industry is so weird that like everything's kept very secret, and the high fashion houses are all owned by caring or lvmh so yeah you can't get into them and yeah. figure out a strategy uh unless you're willing to give a part of your business away right yeah um so we learned Would a lot along not, the way you guys no, never yeah. um if we ever will i don't know we'll see what happens but not up to now it's always been just us at what point would i'm trying to think why why would you want to give away equity would it just be to be able to just scale even faster yeah, I guess so. But like when you see brands do that, it always ends up bad. Like I've never seen yeah. such a great, su- successful story of a brand going, getting valued at this. And then they're actually not. It loses its personality yeah. a bit, doesn't it? There's all this press around it and everything. everyone thinks it's doing amazing. And behind closed doors, the business is stagnant or these people have come in, changed the whole dynamic of the business and it doesn't work. So I've always been like reluctant to doing that. Is it what are the brands have you do you rate or have always rated that you think are like doing a good job? Um or inspired you? My favorite brands. Yeah. I love Bottega Bonetta. Love like their shapes, silhouettes, fabrics, insane. Always love Louis Vuitton, Dior. Just all the high fashion brands, man. The way they can execute product is amazing. Price points obviously no, because like since the since the start of the brand, I always wanted to be amazing quality stuff like i wanted to be able to over deliver on Mm -hmm. everything we do whether it's just the attention to detail the fabrics the fit the instagram page whatever it is i want it to look like the best it can be but then still be attainable Mm -hmm. like i want the the normal guy that's 25 to be able to purchase it i don't want it to be an 800 pound hoodie that you can only get if you're quite wealthy yeah I think a lot, a lot of brands that. will start to do that when they're doing well. They're like, oh, it's yeah, yeah, prices yeah. up. Even people have said that to me. They're like, oh, why don't you just, you know, put the, the shirts, the yeah. shorts, some crazy price. And I'm like, well, no, because it, it the, the the quality doesn't represent, you know, right. being it a 500 euro yeah. pair of swim shorts. Like that would just be ridiculous. If a pair of swim shorts costs an ex- exceedingly high amount to make because of the quality, then of course I would charge yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would not do it just for the sake of doing it. Yeah, which you see a lot of people do and a lot of people mess up with that. We get greedy with it. And the good thing is about rep is 
we can sit in the stalls against Amiris and Pradas and Dior's and sit in the same spaces of them. Mm. But my price points are four or five times less than them. Mm -hmm. So we we sweep the floor with it a lot. So it's good. It means guys can just buy more of them. Yeah. I've seen some guys, they go to pop-ups and they're like, they've bought like hun hundreds of items. Yeah. There's that guy who's always there at like two in the morning. <laughs> it's yeah, like the number one. To him. <laughs> what a guy. But there's loads of them guys all over the world that are just like, they're fully bought into the brand. Like they live it. They live it like I do. And it's good because like... But why, why is that? Is that? Do you think that's because of you? Or do you think that's no. because they're following the story which you... Yeah, they're growing up with it. Like mm. for me, it's always been a, like, I want to make clothes for me. Mm. And I know that sounds selfish, but... Like if I don't want to, if I'm going to make clothes for someone else, I'm not going to enjoy it. Yeah. I want to make things that make fit fit me well, complement how I look, and everyone else can feed off that. Like I'm a normal guy. I'm 30 years old. I like there's millions of other people in the same position that want to buy the same kind of clothes. Mm -hmm. So why not just make them for me? Like, I don't need to go out and look for another demographic. Yeah, that's what I've learned about my stuff. If if I don't personally like to wear it doesn't work does it then nobody really wants to buy it yeah and then it makes me think well why, why am i selling something that i wouldn't wear myself yeah so i've tried and tested a couple of things and the things which i thought oh yeah this would be cool i wore it a few times and then i end up just wearing something else because i like it more and then i'm like well should you I've, do I've not made it the way i wanted to make it yeah so i either try and make it better or i just scrap it yeah there's been loads of things i've done which i've just it's a scrapped. constant battle isn't it like yeah when you've got your own brand and you want it to be how you want it to be, then I think you just got to ride that out. Mm -hmm. Don't go chasing something else with it. Yeah. What would you say in the the past 10 years or maybe recently has been like the, the toughest period or like the thing that's been the most stressful for you? Like we were talking about then really, I, I, in like 2018, I kind of fell out with it, fell out of love with the brand. Like mm -hmm. my attention was elsewhere girlfriend this didn't want to do that didn't want to be where i was like hated the office environment that we had um and i just started really like disliking what i was doing every day didn't like myself um and the brand slipped like the clothes we were making weren't the clothes that i wanted to wear like we were trying to keep up with fashion weeks and runways and trying to make things very like eccentric and not not like essential product that just lads want to wear yeah. Um, so we lost our footing for about a year and that's where it kind of then... Did you know it's like there was a dip in sales? Yeah, yeah, everything went down. Um, it was a bad time, but it was such a good realization. Mm. You know when people say like, oh, they go through a breakup and they come out of it and they yeah. turn into a different person. That's kind of what happened with my brand. Mm. And it's almost like you sometimes need to be in an uncomfortable situation to... Yeah. And once it. you realize that like them hard times actually are the best times because it makes you then change your mindset on something. Yeah. And then you go out and do it properly and it works. That's the best for me. That's the best mm. feeling. Would you say that you don't really have time now for a girlfriend? No, not at all. I, I always used to say that in the past, mm -hmm. but that was just because I was stuck in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't not have time. I just delegate 100% of my time to myself. Yeah. Um, which is quite quite secluding, and I, I like as much as I say, as much as I believe routine and like being disciplined is the way forward. I do think there's always got to be a slight adjustment to that where you can step out of it and go and do something else. Yeah, I think that's um, it's very important, especially if you're in the early stages of actually building something and you're trying yeah. to get it off the ground. I would seriously ask yourself if you do have time to, to allocate things. to you yeah. know, being with a partner. The phases of my life when I've gone through like serious growth and I've had to put in some work, I've just had to say like, no, like I'm realistically, I don't have time to be dating, Yeah, you know, spending all day at the beach or whatever or with this girl. Like I just need to grind this out for the next yeah. couple of months or whatever. But do you not find like there, there will be the right person that will accept that? Or is it impossible? I don't know. I'm asking you this. Like, can I think you... there is, but I think that, like, especially with me, this has to be very understanding. Yeah. Like, they just need to know, like, you you are you're building something massive, yeah, and you are going to be working a lot of the time. 
So if they're that type of person that just they constantly want your time and attention, they're obviously going to be annoyed, frustrated, probably yeah. unhappy. You'll have arguments, and then it probably won't work out. How many times has that happened with you? Quite a few times. But I think I've realized there's just different types of girls. Yeah. So there's there's there are some girls, especially if they've been in relationships in the past, where they have done everything with their boyfriend. They have trained together, they yeah. like live together, they hundred percent of the times with work, them. like yeah. they do everything together. When they've gone from a relationship like that and then they try like being in a relationship with me. They're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Like, why why don't you want to spend time with me? And then they get suspicious and then they think I'm like doing other shit. <laughs> Complete change of dynamic. But yeah. like if a girl's mature enough and she's done stuff for herself, she I'm sure she'll understand. Mm -hmm. So just about finding the right people, I guess. But I think as well, like today, like there is there is a lot of women women that have become successful. Whatever successful means. But they've they've managed to earn quite a bit of money. They've mm -hmm. grown a following. But in reality, that work, it's not like it's not what I would class as work. Right. Like for me, you know, a busy day of working is like hours of graft, like doing maybe a couple of different things. Yeah. But it's like it's a lot of work. Whereas for them, it might just be like, oh, I'm gonna take a picture, I'm gonna make a video, post it. Right. Bam, done. So like work can be defined in yeah, completely. different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it's hard because people people think that like yeah, it can be defined in different ways. People think you can be working all day every day on this certain thing, but you might just be doing ten minutes of it and five minutes here, right? Mm. And I get that girls are like that, but when you get your business to a certain point where you have people in place doing other things for you, you can go and make it look like you're doing a lot of work, but you're not. Yeah. So I guess that's when you can find the time to have the right relationships. Yeah. Whereas if you're on your back against the wall all the time, like you're always worried the business is not going to do well. And then you're going looking for this girl and then she's watching you do that and you're working all day every day at 15 different jobs. Mm. She's going to be pissed off. Yeah. Do you, do you ever have this fear of the brand just be becoming uncool? Yeah. And nobody. Died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I talk about it a lot with all the guys in the business, and everyone's just like, what the fuck are you going on about? <laughs> it's weird though, because I, I have it with social media sometimes because it's yeah. it's really, really hard to stay relevant and to consistently stay relevant. Yeah. But like, do you think a lot of it is inside your mind? Like, you, you'll think probably so. think after a few days of not posting, you'll think, shit, are, are people yeah. going to start ignoring me? It's, it's, um, it messes with your head, and mm -hmm. I think that. But that's the problem, though, with social media because if you, if you don't have a presence, yeah, then somebody else will just take your place, and then you kind of become invisible. Obsolete, a bit. Yeah, and you see it happen to a lot of people, especially mm. on YouTube. I think that's the hardest game to sustain if you came up that way. Yeah. So props to you for doing uh, yeah. that. Yeah, I think for me, I've gone through phases. It's yeah. like at the end of the day, it's just, it's how badly do I want it? If mm -hmm. I'm going through phases where I'm like. I want to make these videos. I want to yeah. travel. Like I'm gonna bang out like two videos a week, and the the drive is there. I'll do it. Yeah, and the numbers are great. Subscribers are up. Revenues up. Everything else is up because there's more people going to my website and buying stuff. But you don't get addicted to that feeling. You do, but what I found is you, I, sometimes burn out. Right. Because especially when you when you do a vlog and you're just going out and doing stuff. For the sake of the vlog, it's like, yeah, you don't want to do it. It's tiring, and it, it's it's very easy to become repetitive. Like even when I'm in Dubai for too long a period of time, people are kind of like, oh, a bit bored of the Dubai yeah. content. Right. That's why I have sometimes I will just go somewhere just to change up the content. But it's um, I've been doing stuff like this, like the podcast. Yeah. It's like it's different. Yeah, it's just I, I do like sit down videos where I just talk about shit. Some people like that, and then some people like the travel vlog. So it's like you can't you can't keep everybody happy, but you can just give right. everyone a little bit of something. Yeah, and as long as you're doing something consistently, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like you got to realize some of the posts that you do or some of the vlogs that you do aren't going to hit the main people that follow it. Mm -hmm. But there's another group of people that will watch it and be like, oh shit. This yeah. is really cool. Or you're going to get a, podca a, a guest on the podcast that doesn't really know you. They'll post about it. Then yeah. more people see you and they lock into it and then they buy into you. They become a subscriber. Like 
you got to think like there's there's not that many people doing it like yeah. to a high level. Yeah, yeah. So you've always got that edge over people where you can come back to it and do whatever you want. Yeah. I think particularly with YouTube as well because it does that does take the most effort. Yeah. But I love it because the this like the videos are around forever and they're accessible for a lot of people. Like yeah. you could type something in, your video might pop up or because you watch something YouTube might yeah, recommend it. Whereas a lot of content, which I see these people like grinding out, like spending a full morning or even a full day making a reel, put the reel up, doesn't really pop off. Yeah. And then it's gone in 24 yeah, it's hours. Gone. gone down the feed. No one sees it again. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of YouTube. Yeah. Um, I, I think as well for me, having a team of people, it used to be me, I was kind of like you with the business. I was control freak. Yeah. I used to be like, I'm going to edit everything myself. Because I was very particular about the way I wanted to be portrayed. Yeah. So that's the hardest part, I think. Yeah. But I, I, I actually enjoyed it. Like I liked yeah. editing because I liked the creative process. It was just so goddamn time consuming. So I, I, I have to eventually just delegate that to someone else, teach them how to edit a bit, especially my first editor, Louis. Yeah. And now Louis. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like as long as you're, authentic and it's your personality on youtube and you are that person mm. it's it does it's like pretty easy right yeah like we've started blogging and no it's no nothing like yours like it's not yeah, but um, the numbers are there though like, yeah it's, it's not good. a personality blog it's more about just like what we're doing mm -hmm. but the first few i was like can't do this hey this hey the way i look stop filming me from this angle like yeah. i don't want to do that don't want to talk about this and then after a while you just you just like actually people love it anyway yeah they just want to see what's going on they want to watch your life people want to see short form video of whatever everyone else is doing mm. like i got inspired by that because yeah. i was watching them and i was like i don't talk about my stuff nowhere near yeah as much as i should do and i think that's why a lot of people kind of they're they're so into it because they can see how much you care about it, how right. much you're involved. Yeah. And even, you you know, you go into the factories and you're shown how it's made. Like, that's really cool. It is. And, like, the main driver for that for me is, like, when I said before, like, I never had a mentor or never, like, you couldn't learn from anyone. Like, you can go on YouTube now, type in represent and see what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You can see what we've been doing for the past year. Like, the blueprint is kind of building via the YouTube with what we post on Instagram and no other brands are that, like, authentic with it. Yeah, and they won't put that like content out there. But do you regret that you didn't do it sooner? Yeah, I, I wish I'd started that when Imagine I started. If you the had brand. all the footage Dude. of you and your brother just like doing yeah. these drawings, which I do have a lot of footage from back in the day. But it's mm. more like when we'd go and do something, mm. not just out and about in the office taking trips. Which yeah, it's, it sucks that we've not got that. But like, if I look back at it in another ten years, we could make a real movie about what's actually happened with the brand. Yeah, which is kind of cool as well. What where do you want to take it? I don't know because like back years ago, it was always I want to be at this number, I want to be at that number, and then you get to that number, and it's like I want to be at this number, and then it's like I want to do this in the US, I want to open these stores, I want to be in all these stockists, and it's like, is there an actual end to it? Probably not. Probably not. Plus, it's my life. Like I don't know anything else. Yeah, you couldn't sit me in an office and turn me into a guy that does something else or I couldn't go into crypto or I couldn't go and do mm. anything else. I, I switch off at things that I'm not interested in in five seconds. I couldn't imagine you selling it and just chilling. No, bro, I can't <laughs> chill. I tried to chill today on the beach for like 20 minutes. Right, get up. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, I think like we were saying before, you wanted to, you wanted to try just, you know, living a little more, trying yeah. a few things. I think you'll find pretty quickly that a lot of the things which you think are going to be like really fun and enjoyable they're kind of a bit like yeah yeah like, it was all right uh, that's what everyone says right that's um, what i've that's I've, what you I've said done it. yeah <laughs> i mean <I'm, laughs> i still will do it yeah of course but i think doing it like properly with the right people would just instead of doing it too regularly yeah just doing it more like as like one-offs yeah, as well really as cool. and having the confidence to go out and do it to the full and mm. still know that you've got a reliable business behind you and all the teams behind you where you, you can actually take a foot like away from it. Mm. Like you can take a few days away from the work without everything collapsing. Like it's all in your head really. Yeah. When your business gets to a point or whatever you do gets to a point where it's doing well, it's not you shouldn't not take time off. 
Like yeah. I was, I would always listen to podcasts where it's like foot on the gas all the time. Don't fucking stop. And I kind of got addicted to like just doing that same thing all day, every day, mm. growing the business, growing the business. But after a long amount of time, like you, you've, you've spent a lot of your life sat in the same position, doing the same thing. Um, and look, time, time fucking flies, doesn't yeah. it? What was an average day for you in the, I guess, not so much now, but for the majority of the time of you doing everything on a day-to-day -day basis that represent what was an average day like? I guess you, I've seen you wake up pretty early, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Five in the morning. It's, just, it's like, the same day that like everyone seems to tweet about now. Wake yeah. up early. Like, I go to bed early though, that's the thing. There, like you said before, there's no distractions where I live. Yeah. Dude, like if you text me after 7 p.m., I'm not replying. I'm done. Mm. I'm in bed by 8. I'm asleep by 8.30. That's solid, that. Yeah. But there's nothing going on for me to be up for. I don't want, I don't have a TV to watch. I don't want to, like, I'll watch YouTubes when I'm having my tea or eating my dinner, whatever. Mm. Right. So, the, like, it's wake up, I'll train. Always train first thing. Yeah. Just so it's out of the way. Mm. Like, I used to train late at night or whenever it'd be. And it just, it gets to the point, I know you do that, but it gets to the point where it's like, I think uh, about it in the day. I, I don't want like to think about it. Out of the way yeah. I don't like to train after. One o'clock, really? I don't like being full. Like, and I don't like having to think about it whilst I'm at work. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I've got to train tonight. What am I going to train? What am I going to do? I'll plan it out the week before or the night before. Just get up and just do it. Yeah. And if I'm not going to give it a hundred percent, what matters? Yeah. Like, I, I'm not looking to build muscle. I'm not looking to do a certain thing all the time. So I can like take my foot off the gas with my training slightly. Um, and I figured out that's the best way I can just be consistent. Still have like little goals where I can go and do a high rocks or compete in an event. Um, but yeah, I wake up really early, back to the point. <laughs> Train <laughs> by like half six, seven, have my breakfast, get into the office for half seven, eight and see what the day brings. I, just, I try not to plan the day out. Mm. Um, obviously Monday we'll have all our strategy days and uh, forecast and planning and what's happened the last week but on them other days it's like I'm there for everyone there if you've got a question on this come in my office if you need me to fit this let's go and fit it mm -hmm. if we're going to spend half an hour deciding what colour like this needs to be I'm there to do it like I just yeah. want to be involved with everything yeah. get home 6 o'clock cook cook a steak watch your YouTube probably <laughs> <laughs> if anything's new <laughs> some weeks it's dry <laughs> and then yeah Wind down, sauna, ice bath sometimes, wow. and then just hit the sheets. You're you're a big believer in uh, punishing yourself before you reward yourself. Mm. So I've seen even when you're traveling, like, like you're something. getting stuck in with the food, yeah. but you're training fucking hard as well. Yeah, I feel like I've got to deserve things, and I feel like I'm. I know I've, I've only got like what 150,000 followers. It's not a big amount, but I feel like I have an obligation to do it for my followers mm -hmm. and I've made this line that's called 247 where it's all about training mindset lifestyle we do fitness where like we have an app that's all my workouts that go out every week to all the customers for free like I have an obligation now for that mm -hmm. like I wake up every morning and I'm sure you get the same thing but you change people's lives yeah like people are like fuck man I'm so inspired by you I've just done 75 hard because of you changed my life just trained for fucking 50 days straight and now I feel amazing yeah. and it's like right I've got to keep that up now because if I start, if I stop doing it, what are these guys going to do? Are they going to stop? Are they not going to live up to it? Are they going to think I'm a fraud? Yeah. Like I can't supply all this stuff for high rocks and talk about it a lot and have all the guys do it and not do it myself. Like and turn up to the event and be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not racing. Yeah. Because like, people just think. Is, is that uh, like high rock stuff like CrossFit? It's like, a, it's a mix between, it's like running and very, easy movements that anyone can do mm -hmm. but it's a quite a hard task so it's like a 1k run it doesn't look fun it's horrible <laughs> i hate it man but i still do it <laughs> it's like it's it's just growing massively now there's bringing it to dubai next year yeah um but it's 1k run thousand meters ski erg 1k run sled pull 1k run sled push 1k run thousand meter row 1k run wall balls whatever yeah. for 8k and all the rest of the stations and you just it's fastest time 
It's mad. It's, it's, it's weird how you like that, but you don't like the bodybuilding style of training. Whereas I, you love the body love body. yeah bodybuilding. Even though it's like, <laughs> even when I put videos up like of me training, I'm like, fuck, that looks so boring. Yeah. <laughs> like, it does I, might look, I, look, I might look good when I do it, but it's like, yeah. especially the way I train, it's like mm-hmm. really slow. Yeah, squeeze a contraction, perfect form. And, I'm like, <laughs> oh. and sometimes I, I, I even wonder, like. Should I even post my workout today? Because I always do this. And it's just like, no. I'm not doing anything different. It's like I'm on the third week of a split, which I'm doing, which is exactly the same as the past three weeks of videos, which I put up. So I'm like, <laughs> should I even bother? But like you said before, you have an obligation. I, I, yeah, I just thought about it yeah. now. Like if, if I didn't post and say 100,000 people on the story didn't see it, how many people wouldn't train exactly. from not seeing yeah. it? You're inspiring people. Yeah. That is that itself is the motivation to do it. Yeah. But I the only reason I don't train like that is because I used to train a lot with with the other George, like all through our twenties. Oh yeah, George Armstrong. Yeah, yeah. bodybuilding. He was yeah. fucking loved bodybuilding, right? Mm. So I'd jump on the back of that, and I'd never put maximum like time and effort into it. Never got my diet right. So I kind of I was like a bulky guy, um, a little bit of chub. Yeah, I was always fat as a kid. So like then I started doing that built muscle and was still quite chunky Mm -hmm. and I just hated the way I looked and I hated everything about it but I still did it because he'd take me there and he'd fucking grill me in the gym (laughs) Um, and then like before the pandemic hit I started running just started fucking going out and giving it 2k's 3k's 5k's 10k's getting addicted to that stuff and then yeah when there was the pandemic was on it was like gyms are closed just so I was just running every day Mm -hmm. and I noticed I lost a lot of weight and then everyone was like Everyone would comment and like, whoa, what the fuck? Didn't know you had muscle. Didn't know you were this big. And it's like, I built that up over five, six years of training mm. that no one knew about. And now I do a different type of training. Everyone then comments like, you can't get this big from CrossFit. It's like, yeah, but I've not been doing, I've done <laughs> CrossFit for a year. Like I half do that, half run, do a bit of bodybuilding. Mm. Like just, I just do a bit of everything. Enjoy all of it. So well, it's mad when you actually get to the point where you're lean, you just naturally look bigger yeah. anyway. Yeah. And then for me, it's like just maintaining my body fat percentage and enjoying what I do, mm. getting faster, getting stronger, getting fit or whatever it is. I guess you doing that style of training or particularly over the uh, lockdown period, is that what inspired the 24-7 race? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, so I, I guess, what were you wearing? If you dude, were, I was wearing Nike. Yeah. Nike trackies, Nike tees. And then I was going to the gym and just being like, I fucking hate the way this looks on me. <laughs> and then me and Mike would just go up to the top of this hill called Rivington near us every morning in the pandemic, go up there and then sling some dumbbells around in the garage. And I was on the way up there and I was like, I've worn this Nike pant now for like a fucking year, but I've like tucked it into my socks because there's no adjuster at the bottom. Why don't we just do one like under wrap? And he was like, yeah, but dude, we've never done something like technical before. So like, let's just try it. Met this guy on LinkedIn that was like doing sportswear and made a pattern out of this Nike pant, changed a few things, put some pockets on it, did the little adjuster at the bottom. And I put it on and I was like, shit, this is what I, what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And I gave it like, I gave it to everyone in the office and everyone I'm couldn't. show everyone now, keep talking. <laughs> like no, no one could take it off. Like everyone was wearing it every day, no matter what shoe it was, if they were going to the gym, whether they were going on a hike or just come like just doing whatever going on nights out everyone was just like i'm addicted to this pant put it online did the most sales we've ever done put it online again did the most sales we've ever done again made this like little video of it which had george in it as well it was like me and george would go to the gym then come to the office do some fitting mm. still in the same pant go for a run in it at night and like that video was like our most viewed video on youtube and instagram and stuff and then it just made me realize that actually this is this pants become a concept how can I build on that? Because mm. I couldn't improve it. We kept trying to find different ways to improve it. And it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work. And then I was like, right, we're getting more into lifestyle rather than just fashion. We're, we're training a lot. We're posting what we're training. Why why don't we make clothes for that as well? So the guy that buys represent who goes on a night out can wear it in the gym or on a run or whatever. Like I want to build their full wardrobe because that's always been the dream. Mm. So I can walk into my wardrobe, everything's represent, whether it's for whatever occasion. Um, and now like it took a year or so to get them fits and stuff right and now it works like 247's fucking it's it's, it's own brand it's class because 
Usually when you wear a tracksuit bottoms, you put anything in your pockets. Looks like you got a friggin' tumor. Like it just looks so ugly. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> these, like you could put something bulky in the side of your leg. It looks fine. And it just the trouser looks exactly the same. Yeah. It's funny, you know, <laughs> the the first time me wearing them, I was in Ibiza. So I'd been out all day, probably been partying. And I was wearing my shorts. And then I went back to Louis' house and we were getting changed because we were going to go out. I think you messaged me. Yeah, and I, yeah. I didn't I didn't have anything to wear and I didn't want to go out with my shorts because yeah. they were just like so short. I was like, I'm not going to a club wearing these yeah. shorts. <laughs> so I said to Louis, I was like, have you got anything I can wear? And he goes, oh, I'll just put these on. So I put them on and I was just like, these are fucking sick. Yeah. And went out and like, it can still look like a smart, casual right. piece of clothing. Yeah. You can but dress it's like it up. so comfortable. And yeah, I like refused to give it back to him. But then he made me give it back to him. So I gave it back to him. And I came here and then I got like three pairs. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's crazy. It's just one of them. Like, we call it a perennial product mm -hmm. where it just, it, it'll last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like you can buy it in 2020 or you can buy it in 2030. It's not going out of fashion. It's just a cool product that yeah. shows what the brand is. And the best thing about it is you can spot it from anywhere. Yeah, Like I see people walking around in it here or I'm in London or I'm, I'm in New York and I'm just like, oh, 247 pants, 247 pants. It's mad that you can spot because you don't have any, there's no big brand. There's no big brand in no, but there's like the little metal bar and the way the pocket shapes, like the little tucks in the corners, mm. you know it's wrapped. Although every other brand's copied it now, you still know it's wrap. Mm. Have you had any other product where people copy it? Yeah, all the time. But I guess that's just like a weird compliment. It's life, yeah. yeah. Like people are always going to try and take food off your table and mm. it kind of gives you a bit more of a drive to do more, right? It's interesting what you said about like you're designing something that you you want but isn't out there. So you've created it from scratch. Yeah. Like even with, I've just released these shirts. The reason why I wanted them was because I remember I was in Saint Tropez last year and I needed to buy, like, I was wearing a vest. I went into this, uh, where was it? I think it was Verde. I went somewhere anyway and they were like, you can't wear a vest there, you need right. to wear a shirt. Yeah. And I was like, oh, he wants me to, obviously, it was like a, a thing they probably do to make money from the shop. Right, all right. So I went into the shop. When I look at some of these shirts they had on offer, and there was one, uh, you know, brand, uh, Viol Violaquin. Yeah, yeah, of Violaquin. Good brand. So, very good brand. Only problem was, like, the sizing's all off. So, they are building like, those shirts for either normal sized guys mm -hmm. or, like, fat guys in their yachts in Saint Tropez. Skinny arms. Big belly. Yep. Skinny arms, big belly. Yep. So, the only one that would fit my arms is, like, the extra large, but it was like there was so much material flying about. Yeah. So I, I tried to get a cu another couple shirts like sim and I had the same problem. So I've just, like with the shorts, yeah, I'm friend. designing products, summer products for guys who are, you know, yeah. in shape, who have bigger thighs, who have bigger arms. You've found it's gaps. narrow waist. You've found gaps for yourself in the market where there's a lot of other guys thinking the same thing, so mm -hmm. they're going to buy it. Yeah. That's the same with me. Yeah. Like I've found that no t-shirt neck ever fit me right. So we did this like wider neck that was like more more fitted to the neck, but a wider um, cuff on it. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize everyone's looking for that. You put it online, everyone's like, "Oh my god, I needed this for so long." Yeah, and it takes off and it becomes your brand. So you just that. you're finding things like like you with them shirts. You're finding things. Yeah. You'll always find for things find things if you go looking for it. Have you found that the shoes has been the most difficult thing to nail? Yeah, definitely. Why is that? Because it's not a piece of clothing. It's not It's not a, a cut of cotton that's just made into a t-shirt that anyone can throw on. It's a sole, a midsole, an upper. It's got to be made 3D. It's got to be crafted out of leathers, rubbers, waxed glues, all these different things, all these components come into this one thing. So it takes way longer than a t-shirt or a hoodie or a jacket to make. I guess um, you've got to get way more sizes as well. You got to get way more sizes. You got to get your sizing right as well. Because if you put a footwear out right there that's not fitting right, or it's half size down, and you can't communicate that because you've not got every store all over the world selling it, you're fucked. Yeah. So it's a hard game. Comfort's a big thing as well. There's yep. some really nice shoes which I like the look of, but they give me blisters. Yeah, and you don't want to wear them for it, right? And it's like, oh yeah, I have like shoes which I'll only wear if I know I'm not going to be walking anywhere. 
Yeah. Which is such a <laughs> stupid thing. Like the whole point of a shoe is yeah. to protect your foot when you right. walk. But I'm like, oh yeah, this one will absolutely destroy me if I walk anywhere. But it looks cool. So yeah, so you'll do it. I'm gonna have to drive there, like walk to the restaurant, to the table, and then just drive home. And then your feet are under the table anyway, and no one sees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it is a hard process, but it's it's the most rewarding one. Because yeah. when you do get it right, it does it blows. Yeah. Yeah. What else is the twenty four seven lineup? Um right now it's like it's all about the the tanks and the tees that fit like the main line do, but the for the gym. Mm. So obviously that crossover of the brand's DNA is now for people that train, which is great because everyone who wears rep outside the gym now wears it in the gym. Mm-hmm. But the weird thing is recently is like there's more people come into the brand 4247 and then go into the main line, which we never thought would happen. We always thought that's, it'd just be people that are getting into training from the main line. Where are they coming from? Um, well, we did a collab with Wit. We did a collab with March On. Like they're coming from CrossFit gyms, they're coming from oh. High Rocks events. Like people are seeing everyone running around High Rocks in it. They're like, what's that? Come and buy some of that. Then they buy into Owners Club. So it's this like domino effect of scooping up the market, really. So you you basically you, you put on event an event which you you sponsor it and you get everybody wearing the clothes. No, we're not even sponsored a High Rocks yet. It's just because we do it and because a lot of the guys who wear rap do it. Mm-hmm. People see it there. Okay. All all the people that are supporting there, there's like like each event. So there's they do Birmingham, London, Manchester, Glasgow. Each event there's like ten thousand people walking through the door. If mm-hmm. If out of the 500 athletes running, 200 are wearing rep, everyone's seeing it. Mm-hmm. They're just like, what the fuck's that 247? Why is everyone wearing it? And it's got like, a, it says Team 247. So it's like, all right, it's I cool. want to be part it's of cool this. Yeah. I want to be part of this community. Like, what is it? And I don't know if you noticed, but like the fitness industry, like everyone wants everyone to do better. Everyone's fucking happy for each other. Mm. Like they want brands to do well. In fashion, it's the opposite. It's like, if you're not cool enough, you're not coming in this door. You're not speaking to this buyer. You're not going into that store your price point's not high enough for us. I'm not wearing that, it's too cheap. Do you know what I mean? So Whereas in weird. fitness, it's just like, oh, that's a fucking cool brand, I love it. Yeah. Do you think operating from inside of the UK, have you noticed negativity? Because one thing, this is a general observation, it's not true everywhere, but I have noticed compared to when I lived in the UK versus living in Dubai, when I'm in Dubai, you're surrounded by people who are, they're relatively successful and they've made they made some money. Yeah. So they kind of, they're there to support everybody else. Like yeah. every guy that I've come across, the majority of the time, is like really cool, really supportive. Yeah. Not really that negative at all. Whereas in the UK, there is this almost bitterness if you start to do well and become yeah. successful. Everybody almost wants to see you fall. It's a shame, isn't it? It's mm. like, it's the same when we go to America everyone's happy for success like they breed success they want it like they want everyone to do well you see it in brands like if your brand is similar to another brand they want to fucking fight you Mm. like everyone hates each other and I don't know why like just no one's no one seems to be happy no one seems to be excited about like other people's success because they want it themselves and they've not got it yet I guess Mm. whereas over here yeah people have got it They've felt it. They understand what it's like. Once you start getting it, then you you you're a happier person, right? Yeah. So then, why would someone else doing well make you unhappy? Yeah. So I think it's just more about like unhappy people that haven't made it yet or whatever that's that it is. Yeah. Mm. But do you think you'll be staying in around Manchester for the foreseeable? No, I've always said I'll move to LA. Um, I always that was, said that's, that's like your favorite place. Mm, I've always said I'd move there by thirty, and I just turned thirty, so <laughs> I've got a year. Why do you like LA so much? Just started going when I was like quite like early twenties. Um, just enjoyed it and made a lot of connections out there. Like it's the fucking place to be for fashion, for music, for movies. Like mm. everything is there. It's the entertainment hub, right? So you can go out, you can meet anyone on that night out. You can go and meet the next billionaire that's creating this movie about this and you can put your clothes on this guy. Like, like you just make relationships that are, like for you over here, your networking's great. There's a lot of gyms, a lot of fitness guys, a lot of people coming over here with big following. Obviously there's all the crypto things, so all them guys are all together. In in LA, it's all like entertainment and fashion. Yeah. So it's easy to get doors opened. 
And it's quite a small place like this is probably quite a small place. It's easy to like get to people. Mm -hmm. So, but I like it because of the weather, the food, that, and the girls. I guess <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier. It's not easier, but it's just the, the girls are different there, and like, it's like here, the girls are different. Yeah. Do you find that obviously the business is very successful? There's a lot of money coming in. How do you discipline yourself by not like excessively spending? Because I I don't see. From what I can see, there's there's no, you're not flaunting yeah. your cash. I know you got rolls, but like it's old now. My rolls yeah. is dead. Love it to bits, but it's dead. Um, I think I got a lot of stuff out of my system early. Like I bought all the fucking iced out watches and chains, and did all the clubs, and did fucking um like Vegas and stupid nights out that were costing way more than we were making and <laughs> bought the Rolls Royces when I was 22, 21. So I got it out of my system. Mm. And like them shiny things now don't, I don't have a desire for them. But I think it's also a bad thing. Like I live way, 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 way be up below my ne means. Um And it's just because I'm so focused on the business. Well, that's a that's it's a, good, a, good a lot thing, of yeah. smart business people would say that's a good yeah, thing. Of course. <laughs> and it's great. Yeah, it is great. Um I don't know, I just don't need anything, man. Yeah. Like I like what I do. I like waking up. I like training. I've got my own gym. Built a gym in the HQ. I've got a load of fucking savage guys that I can go one mile down the road and train with. Mm. Like that's where I get my buzz from. I love going into the office, everyone being happy, everyone working on something. I don't need to go and spend money. Yeah. Like I I, I don't even like paying for a business class seat like, yeah. it annoys me i'm like i like that could be for, some, for someone else i could be someone like i could go and give that to someone in the business that's not doing so well or needs this for this or like i don't want to be i'm not an eccentric person mm -hmm. and also as well like i'm a leader i've got 70 people underneath me i don't want them seeing that yeah like it's not inspiring is it yeah i think that's that's a very good point if, if they're looking up to you and watching you spend like crazy and then come in for a raise and not getting a raise imagine <laughs> yeah. that what are they gonna think yeah but that's what like that's why i've never done it because it's it's the it trickles down right and yeah. i don't want to put up put up that image to people who work in the brand and luckily like no one no one really leaves mm. like out of 70 people that's in there now nearly like no one's resigned one i had one person resign last year it's been years since anyone else. So it's like the, they all understand the mission. They're all bought into it and they want to be a part of it. So it's good. Are you offering any one equity that works for you? Or is it all like salary and bonuses? Um, salary and bonuses, but I don't know. The, we'll, we'll put some things in place for like yeah. the guys that are really pushing forward with the brand. The guys that can take things off me and Mike stress wise yeah and they're fully bought into the brand and like drive out like live the brand then yeah of course yeah I remember you saying that you you literally have no problems hiring new people because there's that many people who are like desperate to work for yeah. the brand everyone everyone in the UK who's in fashion wants to work at rap yeah it's fucking amazing but I would too yeah I'd want to I know it sounds fucking corny but I'd want to work for me why not why not like I want to go and be that guy. Mm. I'll go and work there. See what it's actually like. I found that I think that's largely down to um social media. Like yeah. when you're documenting your life and people can see what you're like, what you get up to. I've had if if I need somebody doing something or I'm looking for someone to fill a position, the amount of people yeah. that want to apply is crazy because yeah. they just want to they're already a fan. And what I found is it, right? they they genuinely want the best. I mean, some of them obviously probably want a bit of clout, but then there are those people that just genuinely want the best for you. Yeah. And they will go above and beyond. And if they can be a part of something that's way bigger than you, why, like, why wouldn't they? Yeah. What advice would you give to all the people out there who are thinking about starting their own brand? Because I get, I get asked this all do the it. time. <laughs> um, and it sounds yeah. like, Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine I can have my own clothes. Yeah. Like, um, what advice would I give? I'd say to them, like, if you're going to do it, make sure it's something that you want. Mm. Like, don't go looking. Like, for me, it's the clothes that I want to make for you. It's the clothes that you want to wear and make and whatever. 
Um, unless you know that there's a gap in the market for something else, do it for what you want. Like if you're seriously into training and you find that there's a certain piece of equipment that you might be missing, go and make that brand. Yeah. Like it's, it'll work. Like everything will work eventually if you, if you're so bought into it. Mm. And would you say it's something that you have to, it's not going to happen overnight? No, never. Yeah. No, there's no overnight successes. Yeah. And even if you see something that is a quick success, it usually comes down just as quick. Yeah. That's what I find out. I've seen so many brands come and go over the time where, like we said earlier, you get like, why has that not happened to me? But then they crash and then they're gone. But you're still there. You're still slogging away. Yeah. Same with I you. I mean, age. even like I, I started doing my stuff when I already had a bit of a following behind me. So I had an advantage. Yeah. But even then, I had expectations of me selling way more than I actually did. And I was like, fuck, this is actually like, I can't I mean, just say in one video, hey, I have some shorts, buy some shorts. Right, right, right. Like you. But they're not your, they're not customers for shorts. They're yeah. customers, that, they're people that are bought into your lifestyle. Yeah. So it's different. Whereas my Instagram has grown, my social media has grown through the brand. Yeah. So they're bought into the, they, they follow me because they want to wear represent or they want to be a part of the brand. They want to live it. Mm -hmm. Like they've not, your customers before this is customers that just, love your lifestyle yeah and not necessarily a shorts person yeah. coming by in that short that's you know what i mean the instagram page is massive but like you see it with influencers or footballers or whatever they go and start a clothing brand and it doesn't work but they've put 10 million into it and it doesn't work because then people just want to see you play football mate <laughs> they don't want to buy your fucking clothes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah i've i've not got a big following but them they then people are like bought into me yeah which is great that's so interesting because I've seen it with a few uh, fitness people that bring out their own brands. Yeah. And it just fizzles out because, it's, like you said, yeah, it just doesn't matter about the number of followers you got. Mm. It's like the quality of them, right? Yeah. How, how do you um, get in there or build relationships with celebrities? Because um, I've seen, I'm, say, I'm sure say I've, like I've, I've, MGK. Seen you, I've seen you post, it was Kevin Hart wearing your shoes. Or? Yeah. I train with the guy who trains with him. I go to LA and train with him. Well, that just train guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, so he like I, I can't remember how the relationship started, but I think Another he perk of being in LA. Yeah, exactly. Same with like MGK, like sent MGK some clothes in 2012, back when no one knew who we were. He was just starting, loved the clothes, and then like he'd DM me, and then he'd be like, "Oh, you in LA? Come and come to mine." And then we'd be sat in his studio, like getting high, like, whoa, what's going on here? This guy's like a movie, a rock star, and we're fucking getting blazed in his house. And then, like, <laughs> and then it's like, all right, let's do a collection together. Then you design a collection, sell a collection out. And then it's like, you're fucking best mates then. That's class. Yeah. But yeah, a lot so of that it, all started out just from gifting the product. Yeah. Hmm. If people love your stuff, they're going to love you, right? Yeah. And if you can get on with people, if you're an approachable person, you're not a fucking a dickhead yeah everyone's gonna like you right what was that story with uh justin bieber seeing you in manchester yeah <laughs> everyone asked this yeah. <laughs> um it was just on tour i think it was on that purpose tour in like 2017 16 17 mm. and we were at a mate's bar and he he came in um when we all looked the same because we all had the same clothes on we all had rep on all black yeah he came over to one of the guys who works at the brand and he was like what is this, what is this uh, cap? Like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's rep. Like, this is our brand. Give his number out to the to his security guard. He rang us in the next day and he was like, I'll bring clothes to the house. Drove to like Cheshire with a boot full of clothes. Dropped all these clothes off. This weird like mansion in the middle of nowhere and there's just girls all up and down the roads like waiting for him to come out. Dropped these clothes off and it like got on the news that like, what's this Rolls Royce doing at this house? Why is Justin Bieber in his car? He weren't in the car. Yeah. We we're just dropping clothes off. And then he just wore it for the rest of the tour. And it like... That's so good. Yeah, it was crazy. That was when it was like a point in the brand where it was like, all right, okay. People are wearing it now, not just because they're getting paid or like they have the ability to wear whatever they want, but they wear rap, mm. which is sick. And that's really. just because you built a cool, yeah. very good quality product. Yeah, that's it. Quality is like always the first thing in our principles. Quality is number one. Like when I'm doing fit sessions, when I'm doing product meetings, it's like quality is the number one thing before anything else. So you'd never release anything that you're not 100% happy with? Nah, because people know. Yeah. I've done it in the past where it's like 
something slightly off and then people get it and then it's an echo chamber there's like fan groups of rap talk and stuff like that on facebook where people are on it on whatsapp and stuff where there's hundreds of people in groups just going got this got this got this need this one the talk like crazy so if you so do something good. wrong yeah. you're you're on there like i see other brands and the brand owners are like start fucking arguing with the customer and i'm like well, why would you do that and then it goes in the re- in the talk group and they're like oh, fucking just stop it like your customer's number one and your product has to be good quality and the rest will follow Mm. plus as well for me it's like i love talking to customers yeah all i do my most of my day i'm in just dming people so you do you're spending a lot of time replying to people yeah as soon as i wake up i'm replying to people i know people say (sighs) don't go on your phone whatever but they're my customers they're my number one feedback they're telling me how they want things to be. They're asking me when things are coming out. My obligation is them. Mm. And people love that. People love it. I think that's got... um, that's the downside of having a, a big following is there's just Too much. there's endless messages. Yeah. And I, ha- I have this thing sometimes where I, I went through a phase. I go through phases where I actually post fewer stories because I get anxious. I get too anxious when you've not replied when. No, just I know that if I'm going to put up five or six stories, everyone's going to be like, bah, 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 yeah, bah, bah, bah. Right. even when I go somewhere, sometimes I'm like, actually, I'm not going to post anything. So I don't like if I if I'm going back to London just for a few days, I don't even post that I'm in London. Yeah, because I have like everybody who's like wanting to meet up, wanting to do up. something, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god. But that's like a massive scale. Mine's not that scale. Mm. Mine's fifty messages a day. What would you do if you get up to like a million followers? Still probably, do the same shit. You would do it. Yeah course would you ever let somebody else go through your dms Ooh, a lot of girls in there man <laughs> <laughs> no i would i would of course yeah if it means that the customer is getting better feedback then yeah definitely yeah mm-hmm. so where can everyone buy represent like all the listeners right um now? the best place is obviously our website because we got the best shipping in the world mm. so you can get it literally wherever in the world within a day or two even like even here yeah, two days. Christ, two days I to LA, two days to Dubai. <laughs> um, within, like, we launch at 8 p.m. on Wednesdays. Most people get their order by 9 a.m. the next day in the UK. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, our website's really good because there's also a prestige system where you build up points. Points reward you, get better discounts and stuff. So, there, or if you're in the UK, I must be follows UK. Uh, there's a large chunk of them there, but there's now it's just it's everywhere. Everywhere. It's, the, the largest ones are, it's, UK, then US, then everywhere. Yeah. So UK, Selfridges, Harrods, Harvey Nichols, Flannels, and mm-hmm. um, all the top like accounts. And then, yeah, you'll find us in like Level in Dubai, um, Unas over here. Is that Level Shoes? Mm-hmm. Level Shoes. What about like if if everyone wants to go and buy their 24-7 they can't pounds? get it there. You can't? No. So have you have to come online. There's no retailer in Dubai yet? Uh, that sell us 247 pant. Or just sell like the clothing. Flannels in Dubai. Oh, in Dubai. Yeah. Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's. There you go. John's got all the answers. Um, they are. Yeah. There's yeah. like Neiman Marcus in the US, Saks, stuff like that. Um, but if you go on the website and you look at local stores, it'll show you a map who sells rep. I'd be curious to see if you set up a store in the Dubai Mall, how that would do. Well, like that's why we're here doing a lot of research. Like, there's a few brands that are really popping off here. That mm. there's a, there's a good blueprint, and there's a lot of Brits here, and there's a lot of people that wear rep already here, which is yeah. great. So, so and even in like in the winter months, like you you would actually wear trousers and yeah, like a jacket does get a mm-hmm. bit chilly. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's an exciting place for us, and I think we will do a lot over here. Like I said, we're doing a pop up in even November or December this year, and then we'll distribute more. Nice man. Thank you very much. Where yeah, can everybody cheers. find you? George Heaton on Instagram. Yeah. George Heaton on everything. Um Instagram, Twitter. Your um, brother, Michael Heaton. Michael Heaton on Instagram. He doesn't have Twitter. And then on YouTube it's just represent Club. Same as Facebook, Instagram on that for the brand. That's my my middle name is George actually. Is it really? So Michael, Michael George. George Thurston. Thurston. <laughs> and the guy in the lobby was like, Are you his brother? What is that? What? <laughs> is that why he didn't ring up? That's why I got no call saying uh, someone Do you let these guys up. <laughs> <laughs> what we thought it was. Sick. Yep. Awesome, man. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Appreciate it.